Yum, yum! Hey everybody, Adam here. Today I want to talk about the correct way to do 32-bit compositing of your CG renders in Photoshop. And uh, let me just give you a little overview and then we'll get some perspective. So uh, here in my file, look at this, I have um, a separate shadow layer with a nice clean white background. This is pure white uh, for you print folks out there. And I can take that uh, shadow and I can turn it up and down, of course. I can uh, then even blur it. I could add uh, smart blur and things like that. I've even uh, gone in here and rendered this actually as a multi-pass render. So I actually have each of my lights rendered separately. So I could take uh, the uh, key light here and turn it down so that I can darken my scene and so I'm just dealing with the fill light and the backlight, etc. I can I have a lot of nice control over this image. Um, and I get really nice clean alphas. As you can see, my edges are nice and clean. There's no black fringe there. And uh, everything, here's the kicker, all of this is referencing files on disk. So uh, if I jump in here and look at these layers, these layers are actually uh, what are called smart objects in Photoshop. They're linking to files on disk, meaning that if I go back to Modo in my case, but for you it could be Octane or V-Ray or Maya or Cinema 4D or 3D Studio Max, whatever you're rendering with, all you have to do is spit out those files Photoshop will automatically update to reflect the changes. So this is actually a really good solution. Now, in the intro, I said we were doing 32-bit compositing for your VFX renders in Photoshop, and a lot of you probably barfed across the room. Blue chunks, it was nasty, it's gross, you need to go clean that up. After you're done, come back, and we're gonna talk about why, first of all, this works just fine, it's not a bad solution. But uh, in your mind, in the minds of most CG professionals, Photoshop sucks, and guess what? It does. Photoshop does suck. You know why? Because it's 30-year-old software. But the upside of Photoshop is that 99.98% of grandmothers the world over know how to use it, and that is why we have to work with it. When I do client work, uh, they ask me to, to, to deliver my files as layered Photoshop files. That's how they work. It's what graphic designers in garages everywhere use. You just, you just have, to, you have to support it. And by the way, I, I make that joke about garages, but the fact is when I deliver a photo, when I deliver a file to, uh, could be Microsoft, could be uh, Facebook, could be, you know, any major corporation that I've worked for, and I've worked for a lot of them, they all want Photoshop files. So this tutorial is going to talk through how to do that. If we look here in the finder, I have uh, all of the files here that were spat out of Moto in my case. Let me go to Moto here, take a look at our scene. This was set up uh, here in Zen using the Pacify plugin, the Pacify Ultralight plugin, I should say, uh, to separate out those passes and quickly give me uh, individual light passes. And then I clicked Render Passes. And in the Moto Render window, all I have to do is save image and save passes as images. And um, the ideal format usually for compositing this kind of thing would be EXR 32-bit. In this tutorial, I'm going to use the uh, Radiance High Dynamic Range format because it has better support within Photoshop. It is uh, not as powerful of a format as EXR, and you CG guys are going to, you know, really want to use EXR. If you do want to use EXR in Photoshop, you must buy the Pro EXR plugin for Photoshop. I can't remember the price. It's not that bad if you're a professional, and it is so well worth it. You're going to you're gonna really want to use that. However, uh, for this tutorial, since a lot of folks are using vanilla uh, Photoshop, we're going to use this HDR format, which works just as well. The important bit here is that whenever you're saving a file out of your CG application, you need to be saving a 32-bit float image format. 16-bit will not cut it uh, for most types of compositing. Okay, so uh, once those are saved out, in my case, I end up with uh, six files, that is uh, one alpha and one final color output for each of the uh, three different light passes that I have. And uh, in Photoshop here, let's just go ahead and start from scratch. I'll just start with a document that is the correct resolution for what we're doing. We have a white background, which is exactly what we want. In this demonstration, let's assume that we're doing a print ad and we really need uh, a pure, perfectly white background so that the rest of the glossy white magazine page shows through. So. Uh, 
uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, go up to our image mode here and let's set this to a 16 bit per channel image. 16 bit and not 32, what gives? Well, Photoshop doesn't support 32 bit very extensively. It only supports it for very basic things. For a lot of what we're gonna do, 16 bit is gonna work a lot better in Photoshop. But for the light passes, we want 32. Don't worry, it's not gonna be a problem. Let's do file, uh, place linked, and then just choose those images. Now I'm gonna choose, uh, first of all, you have to do them one by one. I'll grab an alpha. Now all of my alphas happen to be the same, so that's fine. So let's do uh, place linked, and that happens to be Apple Shift D on the Mac that I'm using. So I'll do that, and uh, hit enter, Apple Shift D. We'll do that, and hit enter, Apple Shift D. We'll do that, and enter. And now we have all of the layers that we need. These have this little lock icon on the right of them. That's because these are vector, or not vector smart objects. They are smart objects pointing to disk, I should say. If I double click on that, it'll show me the actual HDR as its own layer here in its own file. Do not modify that. It's very important that you don't modify this because that's the actual HDR image on disk. And if we re-render and export from Moto, in my case, then uh, we want this to update properly. So let's not change that. Uh, let's go ahead and select these three layers, right click them, and convert to smart object. That's gonna put all of my lights in a single file. Now if I double click this, I have a smart object containing just those three layers. Now, because our original file is 16 bits, so is this one. Let's change it to 32 bits per channel and don't merge and don't rasterize. And now we can set these to linear dodge, add mode, and we have our full composited image. I'm going to set the uh, opacity on these guys down to about 85%, something like that, so that uh, this isn't quite so bright. And that looks pretty good. Now, uh, to, to save these changes, all I do is just, you know, Apple W or close and then hit save. And uh, that's going to bring me back to the main image here, the main composite. Now, putting this together is a little bit tricky. We're going to have to apply our alpha mask manually because Photoshop doesn't support uh, natively, and at least, it doesn't support alpha masks as linked smart objects. But this is not that hard to do. You just have to do a little bit of pixel math, um, and, uh, and trust me, it's not as bad as you think. So the first thing I would do is take the background here, and let's just set it to a color. Um, I'm going to make it a nice bright green color so we can see it really well. That way we'll know uh, when we're doing this properly. Next, we need to take this layer and duplicate it. Let's right-click and duplicate. I'm going to put one of them on top of this other layer. Let's hide these other two layers for the moment and just think about this guy. So the first thing we want to do is knock this out so that we're just looking at the, the, uh, the circle itself, right? Well, uh, the way to do that is using, you know, addition and subtraction in compositing speak. I won't get into all of the pixel math and why this works. If you're the kind of person who just wants it to work, just follow the instructions I'm about to give you and it'll work great. If you want an explanation of the actual pixel math, we can save that for another tutorial. So anyway, let's take this top one, let's make it visible. We'll change that to darken. So now all of the black pixels are darkening everything else and we end up with just our sphere with everything else being black. I can now select that stuff, group it into a, uh, an, an actual folder, and instead of pass-through mode for the folder, we want to make this linear dodge, aka add. Okay, now that didn't seem to change anything. That's because the background of our image is black. So uh, let's show our background here. Uh-oh, that's no good. So here's the deal. We're just adding all of these pixels to green, which makes them look all blown out and crazy. What we need to do is put a, some black pixels right behind this so that only the sphere gets the black. The way we could do that is to show this other alpha. Let's go to its mode and put it on subtract mode. There we go. Now we have our knocked out image. And look at that, it's a nice clean alpha. Now if you were to use multiply layers the way that a lot of people kind of reflexively do, multiply multiply and screen, then uh, the edges of your, uh, the fringes of your uh, alpha masks are gonna get all gray and screwed up. That's why it's important that we use 16-bit math and not 32, and why we use uh, uh, darken and subtract in these cases for the alphas rather than multiply and screen. Okay, so um, now I can just take this guy, let's right click, duplicate this layer, okay, and move it down here. And this guy is going to serve as our shadow. 
Now what we have right now looks pretty much like, uh, like the original image. What's the point of all the work we just did? Well, now we have a shadow that is separate and therefore controllable. See, I can turn up and down the opacity of that shadow, and so I have some nice control of it. But uh, also, the thing is, when you do a render, if you look here, this is, uh, we have a blue light over here on the left as our fill light, and a warm light in the back, and the floor has all of that nice richness to it, right? You've got this kind of bluish reflection down here. This is not pure gray, this is blue, and over here, this is not pure gray, this is yellow. And if you lose that in the floor, you lose a lot of realism. That's why I don't like to use shadow catchers in Modo that uh, just create sort of a, a quick version of what I'm about to do. Instead, I render out the full floor using actual physical ray, ray casting. And then all we have to do is set this layer to multiply mode. But don't now it's just modifying what's underneath it. So we've got the green showing through. And to get rid of the background here, the part we don't want, all we do is grab our lasso tool, uh, or our uh, marquee selection tool, I should say, and uh, select a, an elliptical mar marquee. I'm gonna hold the Alt key or Option key on a Mac and uh, drag out just an ellipse around the shadow that I want. Come over here and click to create a mask. Now, uh, we're seeing the edges of that quite a bit, so let's select that mask. We'll go to our filters. Go down to blur, do a little Gaussian blur on that, and let's blur it by however much we think we need to to get the visual result that we want, and that looks pretty good. So now we have a nice shadow that has color, it has all that richness and depth, but it's uh, also masked out, and we can take our background now, finally. We can use, uh, we can fill it with white, and this, my friends, is a pure white background with a nice, rich, detailed shadow that is separate from the main image. So we can turn that up and down if we need to. We can add levels to it. We can blur it. We can do uh, whatever we need. And this is an extremely controllable setup. Now, here's where the proof really comes in. Let's go back to Moto and make some decisions. Let's uh, remove my ultralight for a moment here. And let's say we need to change some things about this image. Uh, I'm gonna take this sphere, for example. I'm gonna middle click it because I'm using the Zen UI that lets me middle click on things to get their properties. I'm gonna set the roughness down to 10% uh, on this material. So we see a bit more of that uh, showing up in this render. Um, I'm also gonna take this guy and uh, it has these, we have these deformable lights that can go from round to square. I'm gonna make this front one nice and round again instead of square. I'm gonna bump up the intensity to maybe six um, just, to, just to really uh, brighten that up. And I'm gonna come over here and actually bump this guy up to two and a half, let's say. And now things are getting nice and bright. One other thing uh, I wanna do just for the sake of this demo is come over to my environments. Let's grab my environment, middle click on that. And I'm gonna turn that up to an intensity of one. So we actually have a little bit of ambient light happening in here as well. Now this is a little blown out. Let me actually turn this back down because I turned up too many other things. There we go. That's looking like a much more balanced render. Now, now I'm ready to go. Uh, let's go build ultralight and hit OK, and click Render Passes. And just wait for a minute. All right, with that, I've rendered all of my passes. I now have an environment pass. I've got my key light, my fill light, and my backlight all rendered out, all with that new glossy material. We'll go down to Save Image, Save Passes as Images, and Again, we'll just do the exact same thing. I'll call this ultra light, same as before. And because it's the same file name I used before, it's just gonna overwrite the images that were there to begin with. Now, when I go back to Photoshop, it will not automatically update for me. What I could do is go into my compositing smart object. It's gonna tell me that these are out of date. I can right click them and update all modified content. Now I have the real final image in here, the one that I just rendered with that glossier material. And uh, because we have these new lights, uh, the, you know, we might want to adjust them somewhat you know, to see exactly what we want. And by the way, we forgot, we've added a new, uh, a new output in this case. So let's hit that Apple Shift D in here. And remember, this time we added an environment pass. So let's drop that one in too. Um, that gives me this nice kind of purplish uh, ambient light happening. We'll add this to add mode right there, so now it is correctly included in our image. We can save that, and when we go back to the final image, we still have a correct image, and the floor shadow is still what it should be, and uh, everything is happy. So you can see this is actually a really smart, really nice way to work with Photoshop and your imported uh, CG data from whatever you happen to be rendering.
Now, by the way, uh, when you send something, a Photoshop file specifically, of course, if you don't send those original HDR files, then those are going to get uh, those are going to get lost, and the the user might see some little warning signs that say, "Hey, I can't find that original file." So, a couple of things to know. First of all, the PSD file that you save will contain uh, a version of the or the most recent version of the uh, pixel data from those HDR images. So actually you don't need to include the external files when you send them to a client. The, the, everything will still work fine. However, if you don't want them to get any error messages, just jump into these guys and uh, right click on them and say rasterize layers. Now they're still 32-bit layers, they're just no longer linked to disk. So when we close that up and hit save, this stuff is no longer linked to, to disk, which is, uh, which is not ideal while you're working, but at least now when you send this to somebody else, you'll know that they're not going to see any errors. All right, that is my tip for the day. I hope that's helpful to you. Have fun. Good luck with it. We'll see you soon. Yum, yum.